All right, my time, my time's not. Do you want to start the time? I just, <laughs> I'm taking all the time. All right, um, perfect. Yeah, about me, I'm again Matthias Leubel. I'm a senior software engineer at Polar Signals. Uh, I work on an open source project which I'm going to talk about uh, called Parker. I'm also a maintainer of Thanos, Prometheus, the Prometheus operator, and a side project of mine is Pura because not enough projects to maintain, obviously. Um, First of all, since you are like into a uh, observability talk, um, we have PromCon actually happening in two weeks in Berlin. So maybe Berlin isn't too far from Hamburg. If you still want to get last minute tickets, they are available. We're going to talk about Prometheus, about Grafana, Thanos, and open telemetry becoming a first class citizen in Prometheus. So if more observability is what you need, that's the, that's the next conference to attend uh, again in, in two weeks in Berlin. All right, back to profiling. Uh, profiling is yeah, really old, actually, kind of from the 70s, um, almost as old as programming, therefore. Um, and uh, what can it do for us, right? So it's, it's kind of an act of dynamically uh, analyzing programs to measure the resource consumption. So we want to see where is the memory, the space um, used, uh, how is the time complexity, so CPU, um, the usage of instructions or networking, etc. So all of these things, like going really deep into, into kind of like the call stack is uh, what profiling can, can tell us all about. So kind of where monitoring can tell us like, oh, the overall uh, service is doing uh, fine or maybe not so fine, like profiling is really deep into like the technical stuff that we'd like to see as engineers as well, so we can troubleshoot what's actually, actually happening. There are two ways of profiling, so one is tracing and then the other one I'm going to talk after about um, um, sampling, but tracing is essentially taking every single event that happens in your program and uh, recording it. The problem is it comes at a really high cost. Not only is it lots and lots of data, but it's also uh, it comes with a, a high overhead. So you pay a big price for doing that. You'll catch everything, but it will like slow your program down by like 20% easily, um, even even more um, probably in in many other workloads. So therefore, sampling profiling is what usually is done. Um, it is kind of just every every yeah for for 10 seconds looking at what is the program doing 100 times per second. That sounds qu quite a lot, but 100 times per second, I mean, we know CPUs are quite performant these days, so we can, we can take a look at like the call stack, what is the current uh, program state, and kind of record that 100 times per second, for example, and then we get like a good statistic overview of how the program is, is kind of doing over time. And the, the cool thing is it comes at a pretty low overhead, um, less than half half a uh, CPU percent or like, yeah, maybe at most like two or three percent uh, overhead for CPU. Um, so why, why should we do this, right? Um, we want to improve performance as engineers. Um, we have many um, yeah, users of, of the uh, Parker uh, open source project, which are kind of building, for example, databases written in Go, and they really need to kind of know where they need to improve the database there, right, for example. But also saving money. So now with like the economy, you want to uh, actually see where is it not really going to, to um, yeah, where, where can you improve to, to cut down some cost and maybe like actually yeah, save up to 30% of your infrastructure in the end. Like turning off 30% of your of your um, servers is is quite quite something um, that you can take uh, the money for something else. Um, let's talk about profiling uh, in Go because Go has it built in into the tools for the language, so it's always a, a nice um, kind of start to talk about profiling there. Uh, and the Go two chain comes actually with pprof. Um, and it comes from the Google, Google Performance Tools, and it is baked into the tools of, of, P, uh, of, of Go. So if you have Go installed, you already have pprof on your machine, and you can start um, profiling your, your applications every, every other second if you want to. Um, the good thing is um, it's built on top of an open standard, so um, pprof uses um, protobuf to actually um, yeah, have a, a formatted um, and interoperable um, um, format that you can share between even different languages. So it doesn't really have to be Go. Um, you can basically create profiles of any language and put them into this pprof format. And you, here you can see 
Um, Go is like obviously super well supported. There are some even like additional um, profile um, types you can take for Go routines or FGProf, which is a community project. And um, some other languages have uh, third party libraries, for example, for Rust, um, JVM, or Python and Node.js. Um, you can find something, but they aren't like as fully fledged as the Go um, runtime has it built in. How do we go from having the code to this PPRO format, right? So you can see on the left hand side, you have a main function and that executes the iterate long, the iterate short function and the, they do some work. Um, and what we do again, 100 times per second, for example, we'll look at the call stack and we see the main function called the iterate long function and that called another one. And then the other one back down uh, at, the, at the bottom you can see is in the, in the example only uh, twice seen. And we take this, uh, these function names and we fold them uh, where the main function is like at the right. Um, so it's kind of the root of the stack and the leaf is always left. So we kind of like read it bottom up. And then we take all of this and we put it into this um, protobuf encoded format where we say the, we give each location an ID and then we say the value we've seen it 253 times. Um, and that's how we can then take it and send it anywhere. We can visualize it, etc. How do you enable it in Go? If you're using Go again, it ships with the with the Go runtime. Uh, you can you can create a new HTTP endpoint. This can be most likely uh, an internal uh, HTTP endpoint. You don't really need to expose it to the to the outside world, especially the command line. Uh, profile has like the flags that you run the code with, uh, the, the process with, so you don't want to really expose it, but creating an internal HTTP server and Go is really easy. And once you've done that, you, you can then use also again like the Go tool chain to go to the local host 6060, for example, pull down a profile, um, and this will be a CPU profile that will take 10 seconds to observe your program state. And then after those 10 seconds, it will have that profile available and then show it in a web UI to you on port 8080. You will then get something like this by the uh, Go, Go tools. Um, this is an, a flame graph or actually an icicle graph because it's upside down. Um, and you can visualize, you can drill down into things and we'll look at uh, some more examples later on. And then the other one is a call graph where you see it visualized in a different way. You see like the bigger ones are the ones that have been like um, seen a lot more compared to uh, other functions that have a lot, less, a lot, lot less memory in use here. Uh, super, super cool. Um, this has been in the works for one or two years, but now is generally available in the Go tool chain again as profile guided optimizations. Uh, what it does is it looks um, like the compiler when compiling a Go program will take a look at um, the hot paths in, um, in your program and then see if there are any functions that usually um, need to be called in the stack by um, calling one function to the other. So like there's a jump um, in, in the program execution and, and those smaller functions, if they don't have side effects, they can be inlined. So it kind of like takes a function that usually is outside your main function, for example, and puts it into that function. And then you get like easy speed um, wins of like two to 7% um, just by using a flag um, in the Go build tool, pointing it to a uh, profile that you've taken up front. And I think the Go Tool, tool chain and the compiler is already optimized itself with a pprof profile. So profiling itself is an incredible tool. We used it for um, troubleshooting Prometheus or Thanos. If there was was something that like all of a sudden we had like memory leaks or anything that was like uh, too slow and we needed to optimize it, we would pull down one of those profiles. But the problem with that is it's only like a snapshot of those 10 seconds, right? Um, so we can not really explain what happened over time. Um, yeah, rolling out a new version, why is it slower, why is it faster, etc. It's quite manual. We need to still like go into our terminal, type down some things, or have something um, um, yeah, pulling the, the profile in some other way. And then again, if you need to go to some um, production system, you need to like port forward or SSH into that machine and it's not really really nice and feasible. 
that's why we have continuous profiling. And again, we've built, um, for example, Prometheus, and we, we needed to do this all the time, so we thought to ourselves, like, there has to be something like a Prometheus that can just like scrape those uh, endpoints, um, those PPROF endpoints, and then put it into a time series database, and then we have it like nicely laid over, out over time. Um, all of it was also inspired by this uh, Google paper, the Google Wide Profiling paper. Um, it's a really nice read if you are into, into reading papers. Uh, it's a good one as well. So again, why development is in production? Um, we've all seen it, like, looks good. We do some load tests, okay, great. Looks also good. And then we put, like, a customer with actual load onto the system, and all of a sudden, like, we have mutex congestion. We have, like, memory uh, leaks. We have all sorts of things. Um, even if you're super, super cautious, um, it still can happen. And we try to, uh, to do our best on our side, but we, s <laughs> we still run into those things, right? Um, and we, we are missing the data and, and context over time. Again, that's, like, the time dimension. We really want to know uh, what what happened like today compared to like a day ago um mentioned uh, earlier as well we want to save mem uh, money uh, we want to understand the the differences and then also we want to understand incidents right and this is one of the examples um shout if you know what this is anyone has a guess um 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 Umke, so out of memory, right? This is super, super typical. You run something, then crashes, or actually the, the kernel terminates the process, and then it sets over, it creeps up over time, allocates more and more memory, memory doesn't get uh, freed, and then again, at like the 31st minute, it gets umkilled again. So yeah, you can, you can probably get to a certain availability uh, with, with a program like this. You can, uh, if you can restart, um, Quite quickly, it works, but like <laughs> it, it's not really like good software engineering, right? So we want to fix it. So um, that that's exactly why the time axis is so important, the time dimension. We want to have profiles over time. We want to um, we want to do this, and and we want to have uh, the sampling always on. It's quite cheap. We can just store it. We can do that all the time, and then we can put that data, those profiles, into some sort of database. We can index the data. We can make it um, queryable. Um, and we can, we can then um, use, use a nice query language as well to, to query the exact things that we, that we want and that we need. Um, and yeah, this is kind of what, what it looks like. Um, similar to Prometheus, that scrapes like every 10 seconds the metrics endpoint. Um, we, we started scraping the heap. Um, and Alox um, endpoints every, I think, like five seconds or something, and then the profile takes a bit longer. So those are only coming in every every so often. But you can see we have like everything nicely laid out, and if like in the middle somewhere the umkel happens, can at least like look where where's like the first profile where the program was starting, and then like the last profile right before that umkill happened, and then we can do some comparisons between the profiles to, to really understand what was happening. And yeah, that's the gist. Like, we want to do this in production all the time. It is possible. It comes with a certain overhead, but it's like so low, it doesn't really matter. We just run our production workloads with profiling enabled all the time as well. And I don't know, like the, the benefits we get from it are just um, completely, completely worth it. And that's uh, kind of a good segue into Parker. Um, Parker is like the open source project where we where we said to ourselves we want something like Prometheus, um, but for for profiling. And then we had like the uh, first proof of concepts, and then over time this evolved into into Parker now. And you can see it. I don't know if anyone has like looked at the architecture diagram of Prometheus, for example. It looks super super close to this. Um, you have like the server in the middle. It has um, the storage it has a um, it has like a, a, a scraper that can then use the service discovery on top where we can s um, s discover all the services from Kubernetes or some other um, service discovery. We just we can actually support the Prometheus ones because we we are written in Go and we just uh, vendor those in as a library and then we can go to the HTTP end pro uh, endpoints and and scrape the profiles from there. Um, we then make that available through the web UI and the data that we have, we can store into object storage. And one caveat there is object storage is also uh, 
there's also a file system implementation of object storage, so you can even use a file system as object storage uh, with Parker. Um, Parker has a neutral governance, uh, again, inspired by uh, the other um, projects. We want to welcome new um, uh, maintainers and team members, so everybody who contributes a certain amount of, of pull requests or over a certain amount of time can become uh, a maintainer of, of Parker. And we wanted to really nail kind of the developer experience, again, similar to Prometheus. <laughs> um, we we want to have like this uh, single statically linked binary that you can pull down. You don't need any dependencies, and you just start it up, um, configure it, give it like one or two flags, but that's really it. And then it starts scraping those um, people of endpoints. Um, and we, we definitely wanted the same label uh, model to be able to slice and dice the, the data that you want like per namespace or like that specific part, I don't care about the namespace. So s things like that are possible, right? Um, but there was something where we thought like the Go tooling is great. We want this to be available for everything, right? So that's where we um, started investigating eBPF. Um, I don't know how many have heard about eBPF and like, okay, the room is <laughs> full of eBPF these days. Uh, how, how many have like a deep understanding of eBPF? Okay, I'm not considering myself either, because those are the people uh, who are right the agent that do that. Uh, I'm, I just know roughly how it works, but I'm here to explain it anyway. So um, I, th I, I really like the analogy of um, think about the kernel being like a browser, and then you have JavaScript. Um, where um, JavaScript is kind of like a dynamically thing you can do in the browser, right? And that is essentially what eBPF is. So um, the kernel is is this like thing that runs, and then you can do some amount of dynamic things. Um, and the really important thing is that the dynamic things, those uh, eBPF um, um, small um, yeah, payloads, they need to terminate. So that's what the eBPF verifier does. So the uh, ver verifier makes sure that your program will always terminate. There's no endless loops in any of those um, um, yeah, eBPF uh, programs. And um, only after that, it is approved and then uh, just in time compiled. And then you can use that small um, bytecode uh, program, eBPF program, and put it into the Linux kernel and then hook into certain things and do some dynamic things um, in between syscalls. Um, again, we need to load the eBPF bytecode that we have generated and verified, and then what we, what we can do is uh, we can just in time, time compile this into the kernel. Um, and the way it works is then that we have like the user space, so that's our Go program or any other language, and then we have the kernel at the bottom. And what we do is we, we hook um, into the kernel, we say we want to run this uh, eBPF program. We want to enable it for certain syscalls. Um, and then we, we um, are able from user space to read these eBPF maps um, from, our, from our user space and, and read some data um, asynchronously from what the kernel is doing. So that's really um, the, the gist of it. Um, and those are kind of like the predefined hooks, syscalls, kernel functions, etc. Uh, the most important one for, for us is the perf event. Um, that's where we get like the, the profiling data from. What does that look like? So every, every time the kernel observes one of the um, processes, it actually um, stores into those, um, into those eBPF maps. It writes the addresses it has seen. So imagine, like the, again, like the main function calling all the other functions. And then those have like a memory addresses, right? So we have like a, essentially an array of, of memory addresses. And then at the, at the end, we, we have uh, how often that uh, specific stack has been seen. And we can then use um, those memory addresses to, to unwind the stack. And we get back like those memory addresses from the eBPF map, where we see, OK, those memory addresses have been calling each other. Uh, and that's super helpful, right? <laughs> Not really. Um, what we then need to do is we want to use something like Dwarf or uh, Go. I knew this was Go PCNL tab. I forgot the exact name um, for it. But that is essentially what the Go runtime uses. If it panics, it will 
take those uh, memory addresses the the panic has occurred in and use those um, those uh, information those symbols in those um, um, sections in the binary to to then kind of like give you meaningful function names right and that's exactly what we are kind of doing as well we are hooking into that and once we have those uh, symbols uh, identified from the from the binary we can then take all of those memory addresses and map it to something meaningful to the human eye. Um, the good thing is it's it's really easy to integrate, at least like on the user side, right? So that's you. Um, you can just start um, this uh, Parker agent, this eBPF profiler, and it will start discovering uh, all the processes and then will actually in the end map those processes to a certain system D unit file or a certain pod and container in a Kubernetes environment, for example. And so far, we had compiled language support for the last year. Uh, we had C, C++, Rust, Go, and, and all of those like compiled languages, and to some extent, just entire compiled languages. We need to do some, some tweaks uh, when executing those uh, to give us perf maps, is what they are called, where they will tell us um, the the function names to to the memory addresses because they change over time, and then really really brand new and not yet released, but um, Ruby has been merged and Python is about to merge into the Parker agent. Um, is is support for for those interpreted languages, so that's super super um, exciting to us. Um, as you can see, some stack traces, and then eventually you can see the interpreter. Uh, calling a main function and then a b c d e and then say hi and and those stacks are actually in uh, those functions are actually in uh, from the interpreter so those are the ones that are actually interesting to to you as a developer right you want to see those and um, you need to do some extra work to to uh, make them show up in um, in the profiles with ebpf but we are getting there, and we have Ruby and Python support, and that's that's the same for Python. You can see in in green is all the Python interpreter, and you can see a, a Fibonacci uh, example here where you can, yeah, visualize how how that looks. Um, again, um, Parker Agent is also Apache 2 licensed, and we take those uh, processes that we discover, we enrich them with the metadata, we put the kind of same labels that a Prometheus has uh, onto them, and then we, we are able to, to kind of query with the same labels that you can copy-paste from a PromQL or LogQL into, into one of those uh, queries and, and find profiles for the exact same process, right? Um, and yeah, the last one is, is super important, no code changes changes required because eBPF runs in the kernel. You don't need to then, like in the previous example, uh, go into your Go um, program and um, change anything or expose anything. It, it really is the kernel uh, observing these things and, and the agent taking care of reading those and sending, on, sending them to uh, the Parker server. So briefly explaining how FlameGraph uh, works. Anyone? Already knows how, how flame graph works. Okay, a couple of people. Okay, so great, great. I'm I'm going to explain it. So let's see if this Google slides and videos, huh? I don't know. So we observe a stack on the left hand side, and then we store kind of um, over time, like every uh, like 19 times or 100 times per second, we kind of store those into the eBPF maps, right? So we see these various stacks, and we just put them into into memory, and that's what we observe. Um, and, and that's the already quite cool. Um, again, in eBPF, they are first addresses, but we do this over time. Um, <laughs> Google Slides are so <laughs> painful with videos. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the one thing we, we do afterwards. We have all of these functions, and we sort them by some criteria, right? So what we usually sort them by is by their function names. Um, imagine like the different colors having the same function names. We want to sort them by, by function names alphabetically so they make a bit more sense. Um, and then... And then at the end, because they are sorted, uh, we can actually combine all of those individual stacks um, when they have the same function anyway into like this larger uh, block um, of, of, uh, of 
yeah, a span in, in the flame graph. So the, the main function on, on the very top, for example, becomes like the, the entire root uh, of the flame graph. Um, and then the individual ones kind of like uh, get a bit smaller underneath. But the important thing is, as uh, the more uh, wide one of those functions is, the more times the stack has been, or this function has been seen uh, in, in any of the stacks, right? Ah, next one. So this is what we what we end up with. Um, as you can see, there's like super wide ones on top, but it was like seen just as much as like all all of those tiny ones, but just multiple times, right? And then we can we can make it a bit more readable by by merging and aggregating them together. So let's look at some things. We have like five minutes left, but let's look at Parker. All right, let's see if this comes back up, because this is like every time we merge something into our repository, the new version gets deployed. And this is actually quite nice right now. You can see we don't have any symbols yet. It takes like up to like five or 10 seconds when Parker starts to actually send all the symbols to Parker. So right now, everything that we see are memory addresses, right? But if I, if I reload again, um, we, we are going to see the same profiles, but now with uh, symbols, uh, if it does reload um, with, with the memory, uh, with the uh, Wi-Fi here. But yeah, now we have symbols. We can see um, how, how often something has been called. We can see we are running a gRPC server. We can click into things. Uh, we can drill down. We have like the query endpoint that actually exposes the, the flame graph. Um, and then we can like really dr drill into things. And we can also we can also query for a specific function. Right now, imagine we are like uh, actively uh, improving improving this specific function, and we want to see what this is looking like over time. Okay, whatever. But um, yeah, essentially that's that's what we do. Uh, it restarted again because somebody deployed something. Um, maybe not use the devil one then. Yeah, let's use the stable one. So here you can see also in the targets page the the agents pushing profiles into into this uh, into this parka, and you can see where the data is coming from. Let's move on. So the storage uh, we we started off with a Prometheus time series database, but but we quickly realized that like all of those function names are so much data, we had to get rid of of um, those function names uh, and store them somewhere else, and then only keep the the um, the memory addresses or only like the actual values uh, in in the TSDB. So Parker's time series database is therefore kind of like started off of as a fork of Prometheus TSDB, but now rewritten uh, on top of uh, Arrow and Parquet, um, and uh, written as a columnar data storage in Go. So we also use profiling to optimize our own database for storing profiles. Um, and the way it works is we have all of these labels uh, of the individual profiles uh, and then the stack traces. And what we can do is we can then, because every column is kind of sorted as well, we can really optimize and we can say, okay, my pod is actually showing up six times, for example, and then store it that way a bit more efficiently. Um, and then once a query actually hits, what we do is we can merge it. Uh, we can kind of aggregate all of those uh, functions, uh, take, a, take a look at the right-hand side. We can say, we don't care about the timestamp value anymore. We just want to take all of those in 64s and smash them into like a final uh, sum over time. And that's what we kind of do if we aggregate over like an hour, for example. And using single instruction multiple data it becomes really, really efficient. Querying, again, um, is almost like Prometheus. You have a query where you say, I want a profile type of heap or CPU profile, et cetera, and then you have these label selectors. So you can say, uh, I want this uh, Parka job uh, profile uh, at this specific time, or you can give a time range over like an hour, for example, or a day or whatever. Um, and yeah, we, we, we then take all of those um, profiles. We can, I didn't show you diffing, um, but merging, for example, how it works is we take all of these individual profiles and we put the uh, values together. And in the end, we see, okay, like this specific time uh, stack trace has been seen 500 times and the other 150 times, right? And that is basically it for Parker. Perfect on time. 
Um, we still want more persistence on disk, um, so it is there, but it's not um, quite uh, the, the perfect uh, persistence that we would like to see. Um, there's more querying, there's more language support we want to put in, um, but yeah, again, it's really open source, it's open governance, so if your company starts using Parker, for example, and you start contributing, you can also become a maintainer. We have a Discord, you can attend our Parker office hours every two weeks to ask questions if you run into anything or you want to contribute. Um, again, we have PromCon in two weeks in Berlin if you need to, to talk about or want to hear about uh, monitoring. And here are some resources, and that is it with one second left. <laughs> Awesome. <clears throat> we we can take five minutes for the three questions that we have. Um, we do have five minutes. Yes, we okay, do. Okay, perfect. Yeah. For the questions. So, um, yeah. What are the most typical performance issues you identified using Pyka, and how do you fix them? Uh, yeah, I think the the most uh, typical ones are actually memory allocations. Um, that is something until you start profiling your programs, you don't even realize, like we always learned in, in, in university, in school, or wherever, right? Like, yeah, like, um, like the L1 caches in CPU are super performant, and then you have like the, the, the uh, random memory um, that you can access, but like the amount it is slower actually shows up in profiling data. So every time you see some, even in CPU profiles, you see some memory allocations, that's a good, good sign to even from CPU profiles, for example, to go into uh, those uh, memory allocations uh, and, and, and tackle, tackle those, like allocate up front, things like that. Great. Um, another question is, is it possible to observe the average time consumption per function calls? Yeah, so that, that is exactly what I, I mean by query parts of a stack trace only. So something like turning a specific function into a... Um, into a metric, right? That would be great. We don't have a reverse lookup. We would need to like find the function in in like an index and then find that specific function over time. We 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 just don't have that yet. And we found that it, like a specific function isn't even that interesting. We usually just take the aggregate over an hour and then look at that specific function. Yeah. Got it. Is there any HA support on Parga? Uh, HA support for Parker itself isn't there. Um, it's quite deliberate for now. Um, Parker itself scales just like a Prometheus, so it scales as big vertically as your machine can get. You can make the machine bigger, etc. Um, but there's a certain limit. You could run multiple Parkers per environment, uh, for example, but there's nothing like a Mimir or Thanos um, for, for that we have for uh, Prometheus um, that is open source yet. Man gotta eat, so we are building that as the <laughs> as the cloud product. That's a scalable version of of uh, Parker right now, and maybe someday it will be open source. But for now, it's it's closed, um, and and that's the one that we're building. Okay. Um, the next question, I think, means what is the Java support on Parker? I guess. Right. Uh, let me quickly pull this up. So we have um, Parker demos, and there is uh, support. And the only thing you need to do is to enable again, like all, many of those uh, languages, you need to enable the perf maps. So this is kind of a, a thing, a file where you need to tell the JVM to write those uh, memory addresses that can change over time to write it to that file, and that will actually be picked up by a Parker agent. Um, and then everything should work automatically. Um, there is some more things we can can make to enhance the the experience there. But for the most part, this is like one single thing you need to do for these uh, just in time compiled languages, um, where you need to 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 yeah, pass one of those flags. Same for Node.js, for example. But then we can we can actually read um, those profiles as well. Got it. Um, how do you often profile in your continuous profiling? Meaning, is it real time or like every two or three seconds? Yeah, so good question. I think the Parker agent itself, we actually found that because we are like looking over like minutes and hours of time, we don't um, profile 100 hertz or like 100 times per second anymore. We just profile 19 times a second. That reduces the CPU load just ever so slightly even more. Um, but we, we have it continuously running as a daemon set. The Parker agent runs as a daemon set on Kubernetes. So that's always on. And it always like collects those uh, profiles and sends them off to Parker. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's what we do. So I guess it's more like sampling rather than continuous. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, the, it, it is a continuous profiling thing, but the 
individual profiles, they are uh, sampled. Okay, right. got it. Um, are there plans to build a recommendation engine? Good question. Yeah. Uh, for now, we have the query engine where you need to like drill into things yourself, but that's definitely uh, in the back of our heads where, where we want to have something where you like, I don't know, get like, you log into something and it like says like, oh, look at these functions, or well, actually you've done great in the last week, you've improved so much on, on those functions, for example. Um, or even something where you get like a weekly report of some sort um, with like the things you, you might want to take a look at because they, they, they regressed over the last week. Yeah. Got it. All right. Um, I think we're uh, on time, right on yeah. time. So thank <laughs> you very much yeah. for this very interesting talk. Again, a big round of applause. And please rate the talks. Rate the talks. Rate Don't the talk forget to rate the talks. And I'm going to be around for, for the afternoon. So if you, if you bump into me, feel free to say hi or ask more questions, etc. I'm happy to talk. Thank you. Thank much. you.